All right, guys, this is my 1995 Mazda RX-7. I'm listing it for sale. I've had it for five years. The car has about 67,000 miles on the chassis. I recently rebuilt the engine myself, um, and it has 1,000 miles since the rebuild. So basically, it's a single turbo RX-7 FD. Um, it's no longer running the factory sequential twin turbos. I've had, again, I've had the car for five years. Um, when I bought the car, it was a twin turbo car and um, it's since been rebuilt twice. So it's been through a lot, but uh, anyway, it's a pretty clean car. Again, it's a 95. This one was imported from Canada. Um, so that makes it a little more rare even. <clears throat> But the interior is in great shape. Uh, you can see the, mop, the matte pocket door lid is still there. Um, leather seats are in pretty good shape. You know, just some wrinkling on the bolsters, but nothing crazy. The seat belt retainers are still working and in place. Uh, no tears or anything in the seats. Um, they're in, like I said, they're in pretty good shape. Driver's seat's a little more worn than the passenger seat, of course. Um, so here you've got the uh, factory school bus steering wheel uh, a little interesting but see there you've got your gretty uh, boost controller your apex epfc commander handheld unit there uh, the shifter is a bnm knockoff shifter i'm not gonna lie it's like straight off of ebay like 60 bucks it does a great job uh, all you need is the aluminum base the rest of it's pretty simple um and i'll swing around uh it has the um bins behind the seats and I'll show you real quick uh, behind the driver's seat. You can see the wires there. I've relocated the battery. So it's a Odyssey PC680. You can see everything's running through one big fuse right there. So that actually serves as a kill switch. Um, so you can actually like basically uh, deactivate or immobilize the car. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start on the passenger side. Passenger side, same story. Everything's pretty clean. Handles are all intact. Uh, the exterior door handles do work. Everything's fine. Uh, I will say that the electronic locks don't always lock the passenger door. So sometimes I just get out and I manually lock it myself. Just depends on where I'm parking the car. Um, so here's the passenger seat. Uh, it's in good shape as well. Like I said, a little better condition than the driver's seat as far as the wear. Um, here's a little part where it's on the surface. It actually delaminated from the surface. I'm not sure if that can be cleaned up or not. I think it kind of like removed it from the surface, but you can see how basically how big that is. It's not a very big spot. Uh, it's not torn. It's just, like I said, it's on the surface there. So a little interesting. Um, yep. Again, the bin behind. Now that one, that bin is in, uh, it's actually still fully intact. doesn't have any uh, holes for wires. This guy is usually where I keep my stuff for pre-mix, so it's in good shape. Um, that's just where I store my that oil. It's got the uh, dividing wall and the factory rear strut tower brace. You can see the Bose speakers po uh, poking out there, so we'll get back to that. Oh, hey, there's my daily. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> all right, now in the glove box is actually where I have my AEM wideband and my um, AEM water methanol controller a little extra wiring there but anyway if you uh if you want to stare at your aem wideband you can pop the glove box open um or you can remount it somewhere i have a little usb thing for the cigarette lighter i think i actually have the cigarette lighter somewhere so anyway that'll come with the car anyway yeah the interior is pretty clean i mean it's a it's good looking interior uh, people usually comment like, oh, that's the cleanest RX-7 I've ever seen. It's great. I like it. So that's the interior of the car. Um, it's got the uh, factory sunroof. It is a PEP model, which is the Touring, which means it comes with leather seats and the sunroof. The seals are all fine. It works. Um, I can demonstrate that for you. Uh, but yeah, I also have a an insert that comes with the car that basically blocks out the sunroof in case you don't want to see the sun for some reason, but it comes with the car as well. And the roof is in good shape. There's the interior um, 
let's see, there we go. So anyway, everything's in good shape here. The, the little uh, compartment lamps work. <clears throat> um, here's the carbon fiber hatch. So it's a VIS racing hatch. Um, you can see there's some, here's one little, well, not little, but here's a crack in the clear coat. I haven't tried to repair it or anything. I mean, it, the, the hatch is in good shape, but previous owner probably in cold weather basically tried to put his hand here and push down and probably that's how he cracked the uh, clear coat there. There's a couple little other spots, um, just some clear coat issues. Like here's a little bit of bubbling under the surface. So I think that's just a water spot, but you can kind of see the, the bubbles in the clear coat. Um, and then there's a couple little spots where you've got some cracks in the clear coat like that. There's another one. So this is like probably like temperature stress related. Um, that's not from like opening and closing it. That just kind of happened over time with age. So yeah, there's that. Um, a little cosmetic detail. See, there's the rear bumper. It's got the old school Mazda symbol. Um, so cosmetic issues. Um, here you can see there's a little bit of paint flaking off near the muffler there. So it's a plastic bumper underneath. There's no, you know, there's no rust, but it's just the paint flaking off. There was a big paint bubble that was right there and uh, it's been that way since I got the car, and then it popped. So I decided to basically sand it and then prime it just so the crack, or so the paint chipping wouldn't spread. And I threw a glorious sticker over it because I didn't feel like repainting the entire bumper. So do what you will. If you want to repaint the rear bumper, go ahead. That would probably solve both of those issues, but for now, <laughs> that was my ingenious solution. Uh, real quick, we'll go into the back of the car. I'm gonna pop open the, the little latch here. It's right there, you pull that and it opens up the hatch. Let me just lift it up. Now it's, it's a little heavy, only because of the, the glass, but you can see here, here's your VIS racing. There you go, VIS racing. I got a little bonsai sticker. So the hatch itself is carbon fiber, right? But the glass is still the OEM glass. It's tinted, uh, pretty dark, but now it's got the uh, the heating elements in there for your defrost, but I don't think it actually, um, it's not plugged in. So that's something that could be fixed. I think the, the hookup's right there. So something I just never got around to. Anyway, you've got your factory Bose audio, right? So there's your acoustic wave system. And then up there, of course, you've got your, your OEM uh, Bose uh, radio in the dash. <clears throat> So back here, the only real big modification is this is where I found space to install my water methanol kit. So I don't have a hydraulic lift kit for this, so I literally have to hold it open. But in any case, uh, the carpet's in good shape, but I did cut it around. It's probably short-sighted of me. I probably shouldn't have done this, but I cut it around the water methanol tank. That's all I did. Probably sew it back together if it interested you, but that's what I did. I needed to make space for the one gallon reservoir. I also needed to make space. So this is where the factory spare, it's hard to believe this thing came with a spare, but um, that's where I put my water methanol pump. So that's where she lives. Got a level sensor there. You know, tucked it away out of sight so you don't really have to deal with, you know, don't see it. It's not taking up space in the engine bay. But yeah, that's that. Okay. You can either drop it or you can kind of like press down, but I would caution the next buyer, right? Don't press down too hard because you see what happens. So what I like to do is just give it a good six inches and it's closed. All right, we'll go into the engine. So without the car running for now. So I haven't really waxed the car. This is actually just like demonstrating how the paint is. Um, I'd have to get up close and personal for you guys. Before I actually go in the engine, let's uh, do a little walk around. I want to show some of the, you know, defects in the body. So you can see a little, probably a quarter size ding right there. It's pretty shallow. Um, that's a paintless dent repair guy's dream. And then there's another one right below. It's really hard to see. So you can see it right there. Um, that guy is also really shallow, but he's a little bigger, probably the size of like a very small lime, um, 50 cent piece. So both of those could probably be taken out pretty easily. <clears throat> um, you know, little, very shallow dings in some of the places on the body, but nothing crazy. 
already showed you the crack in the clear coat on the hatch. Um, let's see, here's another little guy right here next to the rear wheel. That one has a little scratch behind it, so that one would be a little more involved, right? It's not bad, but it's not it's there, so. Um, there's another little ding right there, All right? And then there's another shallow, very shallow ding in the driver's door, or sorry, passenger door. And then up here, last one, is this very shallow um, kind of impression on the front fender, front passenger fender. So there you go. It's pretty shallow. It's actually pretty hard to notice, but when you walk around the car in sunlight like this, you know. All right, so the hood I vented, I did a, a little DIY project. So this is my handiwork. You can see the paint's not perfect. I basically like, try, you know, edged around Forgive the scratches there, I'm sorry guys. But it's pretty clean, it's not perfect, but it's there. And the purpose for this is to let the hot air out of the engine bay, especially with the single turbo system. Uh, you got a lot of heat on that passenger side, so if you're kind of caught in traffic and you're just idling, you're, you're gonna watch your water and your air temperatures go up um, just because, you know, <laughs> it's like all that heat has to go somewhere, right? So this drastically reduced the uh, air and water temperatures. So it does a great job of cooling off uh, the engine bay. Here you can see you got the kind of like the R style front lip. I think this is an OEM lip. So it's the two piece. Um, it just came with the car that's, I never touched it. Uh, you can see a little scuff there on the passenger side. It's actually got dual oil coolers. So you got the, there on the passenger side and there on your driver's side. So your RX-7 aficionados will tell you that the PEP, the touring model, never came with dual oil coolers. That's correct. This one has been updated to kind of have the, the goodies that came with the R1 and R2 models. Um, and then on top of that, of course, it's got the sunroof and the leather seats. So you can thank a previous owner for that one. And if anybody's interested, I can kind of go through the whole history of who owned the car before me, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to use my little hood stick. All right. So that's under the hood. What I did to accomplish this is I had to cut some of the, uh, there we go. I had to cut some of the support, you know, the webbing around this. Really all I removed was uh, from here to here, that cross brace. It looked just like that one right there. Um, it just allowed me to make that cut. The, uh, I mean, yeah, technically that's a, not fully supported now, but it's not going anywhere. So my intent was to use some epoxy and use like a, a stainless mesh, you know, behind it and paint it all black and just make it look flush. But uh, just that's where I left it. So this is the engine. I'm getting focus there. There we go. Um, so again, it is a Borg Warner single turbo. That is a uh, Borg Warner S366. So I think it's a 67 millimeter compressor. Um, on the cold side, intercooler plumbing, that's two, two and three quarters inches. It drops down to the Gretti front mount intercooler. And then it comes back up on the driver's side. Um, and on the discharge side, uh, basically the cold side of the intercooler. I wonder what I called that just now. That's the hot side of the intercooler. This is the cold side, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's three inches going into your uh, Gretti intake elbow. And then it's a factory upper and lower intake manifold. The only thing that's been changed here is that the throttle body has the secondary throttle plates removed. And I believe the original purpose of those was for drivability and for um, emissions. So when you're trying to make peak horsepower, that only restricts your, your intake flow. So that's all been removed. Um, so a couple more little details about what's going on in the engine bay. Um, I've relocated the coil packs. Those are basically, uh, they're the AEM smart coils, MSD plug wires going to some NGK racing plugs. Um, so I got some gold anodized pulleys. You'll notice here, <laughs> this is uh, not the best. Notice that's only got four ribs on what's supposed to be a six rib belt. Um, that's because these gold anodized pulleys decided to shred one of the, the lugs off and then I forgot which side it. <laughs> It tore off so I put it back on and then it tore off another one so in any case I'll replace the belt for the new owner but um, that uh, 
the way I get around this is just run a five rib belt and the only thing that's on that pulley now or on that belt is the power steering. So it doesn't really cause any issues, but I have the OEM pulleys if anybody's interested. Um, so beyond that, there's no emissions. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's got the rat, rat's nest eliminated. Uh, it has no AC. It has no oil metering pump. So I premix at about 1.2 ounces per gallon and I only use Castor 927 Premix. So it's kind of expensive, but it's good stuff. So I just fired the car up basically to get the car down to the base of the driveway and you can see it's holding fuel pressure pretty good. Um, so I'll uh, do a cold start for you guys and you can see it warm up, but yeah, so I mean, that's, that's the engine bay. You got your Koyo N-Flow radiator. I think I forgot to mention that in the post. It's the uh, OEM electric fans. They do a great job. There's no real reason to replace those. Um, my fan relays have been, uh, sorry, not replaced, they've been relocated. So they used to be over there on the uh, strut tower passenger side, and then I relocated it over here. It just looks a little cleaner. Uh, there used to be wires basically running to it, and I didn't like that. Uh, you got your gold reflective heat tape on the intake manifold. Um, so the purpose is, of course, there's your downpipe for the turbo, and you're trying to reflect some of that heat so you're not soaking your, your intake temperatures. Uh, real quick about the fuel, it's got a dual in-tank pumps and one of them runs on a pressure switch. So basically it only runs on one 340 liter per hour Aeromotive Stealth fuel pump. And then there's a pressure switch right there mounted on the intake elbow. And basically there's a little screw there and a little pressure kind of uh, sensor type thing. It's a mechanical switch. Once it sees sufficient uh, boost pressure, it basically tells a solenoid to turn on the other fuel pump. So then you have a total of, what, 680 liters per hour between the two pumps. They go through a dash eight fuel line. And then when it comes to the engine bay, it splits into two dash six lines. And then you've got your, there's your KG parts secondary fuel rail with uh, Bosch. Uh, they're the 2200 CC injectors. And then it's the factory it's the OEM primary fuel rail, but it's the, what was originally the OEM side feed 850cc injector. So basically this car has enough fuel to make as much power as this engine can withstand. Um, it's just, you know, wanted to make sure that it had sufficient flow. There you've got an old school blitz blow off valve. <clears throat> it works, but you know, it's not pretty. That's why I kind of like hit it out of sight. Um, right there, that little nozzle, that guy, that's your AEM water methanol injection. That's a, I think that's the threaded nozzle inside of that is the 1000 cc nozzle. Um, there's your Moroso oil catch can. You can see the line that runs to it. I have it snaked in there pretty good. But that runs to the oil filler neck or where it used to be. It's been adapted um, by, or, <laughs> sorry, it's been adapted with a uh, Dash 10, an AN, fitting to allow you to just kind of run a hose wherever you need in the engine bay. Um, so this is the one of the fuse boxes. I understand this is not very glamorous, but it's uh, held on by zip ties right now. So you could do something with that. Uh, then the other fuse boxes are in the factory location. They haven't been moved. <clears throat> Still has the uh, factory brake booster. Um, and then it's got a, a new uh, clutch master cylinder uh, running the GM floor bar map sensor. Forgive me guys, I'm uh, you know, bouncing around here, but it's I'm just kind of pointing out what I can remember and what I see. Um, but yeah, that's the engine bay. Um, so a quick point about the exhaust. This is probably one of the most awesome parts. Uh, it's a three and a half inch downpipe to a three and a half inch exhaust all the way back. So off the turbo is a mild steel downpipe. Um, you've got your wide band, you know, your um, O2 sensor there. And then basically what happens is after it leaves the engine bay and it gets down to right about here, it switches over to a V-band um, and it switches over to aluminum all the way back. So the exhaust is incredibly light. Um, it's not too loud, but you'll hear in a second. <clears throat> so there's the aluminum exhaust, fully custom. And basically it's two inline vibrant resonators. Um, they're not really mufflers, but that's what it is. So we'll do a cold start. And you guys can see how she does. 
So for you, again, for you RX-7 aficionados, the cold start isn't the challenge. It's the hot start that's the challenge. So we're going to let this guy warm up. I'll turn it off and restart it, and then you'll get to see what it, you know, how much compression it actually has. <clears throat> so no check engine lights, no issues. The only thing is this coolant gauge right here, the, sorry, the water temperature sensor, he actually doesn't read. So he stays on zero. The level light, level indicator light that's uh, mounted on the thermostat housing, he does work. Um, this is just something I haven't gotten around to fixing. Um, the water temperature is actually being monitored by the Apex EPFC. So it's monitoring from a different location, I believe, uh, but you can see the 36 degrees Celsius there. It's a hell of a lot more reliable than this little analog gauge. So I defer to my handheld for my water temperature. So here goes a cold, roughly cold start. You can see my water temp's already at 36. So I did uh, turn it on just to get it to the base of the driveway.
seat belt. All right, so we're pretty warm now. I would recommend waiting until it gets into like the 60s or so before you start driving, 67 degrees water, uh, water temperature. So there's my B&M short shifter. It's pretty distinct. I mean, it's like a nice, you know, distinct throw that we don't get miss shifts. Uh, it has solid engine mounts, so you're not really gonna miss shift anyway. It's an AEM um, six puck sprung clutch. So it's a little bit heavier, obviously, than a stock clutch, but not terrible. Long enough of a 
drive so you guys can see, you know, going down to uh, the gas station, get the car fully up to temperature and you guys can kind of see what it's like to live with one of these. Spare you guys the boredom of filling up. 